All right. Anyway, uh, welcome everyone. I'm happy to see you uh, on our uh, regular user group meeting, which is number 17. <laughs> so yeah, it's been a long way. Today we will uh, mostly be focusing on uh, key informatics and uh, some other uh, topics uh, can be applied uh, as generally uh, as well as for key informatics. So we have uh, four interesting topics today. Uh, first one will be uh, meshed molecular pairs that uh, Leonid will describe. Uh, then we will uh, go over our new uh, really cool functionality, which we call uh, sticky meta uh, that Konstantin will uh, tell us about. And then uh, Alexandra will uh, tell us about uh, the uh, docking capability, how to dock small molecules uh, within uh, pockets and proteins. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, David will uh, showcase uh, hit design application and possibly hit triage too. What's uh, great is that uh, all of the features that uh, we see uh, earlier, like mesh molecular pairs and sticky meta and docking, uh, they can be used uh, as well as uh, standalone, uh, but also as part of uh, the fit for purpose applications such as uh, heat triage. So you will see all of that uh, today. With that, I'm passing the stage to Leonid, who's our first presenter. Um, Leonid, oh, you are mm -hmm. Am I present now? Yes. Um, Great. Uh, so uh, my name is Launis, and today I will introduce you to a new cheminformatics tool uh, at uh, DataPro platform called Matched Molecular Pairs. Uh, and it is mainly uh, considers the analysis of matched molecular pairs. Uh, this type of analysis could be interested for chemists to analyze structural data associated with uh, different activities or uh, other properties uh, anyway, any values associated with structural data. Uh, it resembles activity cliffs analysis, though activity cliffs is continuous type of analysis, and this is fragmental. So we can uh, see the fragments uh, that, when changed, uh, can um, can yield in difference in activity, permeability, and toxicity. And yes, we will deal with the data set containing structures, activity, permeability, and toxicity values. So let's start. Uh, to run the analysis, we should go to uh, Camp Top Menu, Camp Top Menu, Analyze Section, Molecular Matched Pairs. We will now select all three variables to analyze and run. So here are the results. All the results of the analysis are grouped to four different representations. They are transformation step, fragment step, cleave step, and generation step. All of them represent the data in different forms. Transformation is used to visualize the different fragments and substitutions of different fragments. Fragment step uh, is used to uh, analyze the whole data set with the, the, the whole uh, set of substitutions uh, in fragmental space. Uh, cliffs is visualization um, on the chemical space. Uh, and generation uh, is the tool to get all the possible combinations. So first one is transformations. Here we can see that we selected a molecule, number six here. And we can see that uh, there are two types of fragmental substitutions available for it in the data set, from the ethyl group to the methyl group, and from the ethyl group to the hydroxyl group. Uh, the number of pairs here uh, represents the number of cases in the data set that have such substitutions. 
Uh, so we can see here, if we change the ethyl group to methyl group here, uh, in mean terms, uh, it will uh, yield in difference in activity of 0 0.91. Uh, but uh, the permeability will be lower. On the other hand, if we take uh, the example of substitution from ethyl to uh, hydroxyl group, uh, the activity will raise even more, uh, but the permeability will be even lower here. So the possible substitutions are specified in fragments section. If we look to the pair section, it is associated to the pair of the fragments in the fragments section. Uh, and here we can just uh, observe all the available options in the data set corresponding to these substitutions. It could be rather uh, valuable information uh, as uh, the mean difference in activity, permeability, and toxicity are formed from these cases. And uh, if you have more cases with such substitution, then the more appropriate result, statistical results you will get. Uh, but anyway, uh, the chem chemist could analyze uh, if the substitution were not mm, as, as he wanted to see, for example. Uh, if we change it, we will see the other set of substitutions. Uh, all these substitutions will be highlighted and the specific values will be shown here. Uh, this is for the transformation tab. If we go to fragments tab, let's do that we'll see the whole space of fragmental substitution. And as you can see here, some cells uh, contain the data and some cells are blank. For the blank, uh, for the blank cells, it means that, for example, this uh, is a propyl group changed to this uh, ethyl chlorine group. Uh, this data is not contained in the data set, so there are no such cases. For all the others, we can analyze the possible differences uh, in um, activity, permeability, and toxicity matched with different bars here and different colors as well. Uh, so, for example, here from this fragment to this fragment, we can see that there will be uh, the loss in activity. Uh, but the positive effect for permeability, though uh, the toxicity will also rise. Uh, so here you can just visualize uh, and analyze all the possible substitutions that are derived from the given data set. Going to the next tab, cliffs, will bring us to the chemical space. And here uh, the usual chemical space is augmented with the, the arrows. And arrows correspond to differences in our analyzed data in activity, permeability, and toxicity. For example, we want to filter it uh, and to get all the cases where activity difference is higher than 10 and the permeability is higher than 10. And uh, uh, for example, just let's click for uh, toxicity value either. Mm -hmm. uh, let's zoom in for this group of molecules. Uh, and here we can see the class of molecules. Uh, actually, they are re really similar, uh, but some groups changes. Uh, and also we can see rather typical situation when rise in activity will have the negative effect in permeability, you know, the rather frequent case in different studies. Of course, we can um, click on the arrows and to observe uh, what is in the data set uh, to make it more precise if you want to. Uh, for any error, we can get the results uh, just like that. So observing this data, uh, we can specify uh, the options uh, or the limits, we'll, how we want to filter and get the specific cases where these situations are realized. All first three tabs are related to the initial data set, but generation tab is related to all possible molecules that could be generated uh, based on the rules obtained from uh, these matched molecular pairs. Uh, for example, uh, let's observe uh, 
this one with permeability. Uh, first of all, we, we see the molecule. It, 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 it uh, is in the data set and its permeability is minus six here. Uh, we get the scaffold, we get the group to changed, and we get the group uh, that will substitute the initial one. And based on statistics, we can um, infer that uh, its permeability will be five and two, which is uh, much more higher than it was initially. And it will yield in this product like that. So these rules are uh, now applicable to the data set that is analyzed, but in our future plans, uh, we will <clears throat> uh, save it as a separate models uh, and it could be applied to any other data set. So rules from one data set will be applied to any other to make such predictions based on these pregnant substitutions. So that is all. Uh, your comments are appreciated. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Leonid. Uh, yeah, I will give you. If there are any uh, questions, uh, that's uh, a good time to ask. Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, switch to the next uh, topic uh, in a couple of seconds. So uh, um, one question from my side. Uh, Lenit, what are the uh, plans for the future enhancements for uh, uh, the MMP? Well, so the first one that I have just told that uh, is to save these rules and to apply them to any other data set to get the predictions of how these properties could change. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I actually have a on. couple of questions also. Yes. So. Should I share in one, one more time? Yeah, I was wondering how the predictions were calculated. Uh, was it just based on uh, the average increment uh, across all the available yes, data. Yes, for now it or is. Or something more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, it, it is now just the mean value of the difference con that was uh, mm -hmm. taken from the whole data set. Though, uh, if we want, it will be Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But right next to much molecular pairs, so uh, in the top bar, uh, uh, where we would say, uh, what, what's going to well, be saved if you click on it? Exactly. For now, it will work for the initial data set. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if, if I want to uh, view that you're currently show, for example, I, I've done this and I want to share it with my colleagues. Uh, how would I do that? Saving each of uh, the data representations. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 one, the one issue is that uh, if you're using a really huge data set, um, it or just rerunning the analysis uh, when you open it, or saving it uh, one by one, also, or storages. Uh, but yes, so this uh, mm -hmm. uh, we are working on this question, and the data, of course, uh, you you will have uh, the possibility to save it. Mm -hmm. It may also uh, make sense, you know, to uh, provide some kind of indication in the prediction column uh, whether you consider it sort of quote quote reliable or not. I mean. Uh, if you, if you based on on average difference uh, for the uh, experimental values from which you derive this, uh, if uh, there's a huge uh, variance uh, in, in that increment, then the prediction is not very accurate. If there's very little uh, variance, the prediction is more accurate, uh, but there's no indication 
some some properties. I mean, as a as a chemist, I I know that, for instance, uh, uh, if you if you do this kind of stuff with uh, log p's, uh, log p's are uh, very easily representable by contributions from chemical fragments, then the predictions are more or less accurate. But if it's some kind of activity against uh, the uh, uh, against some biological target, then it's it's not so usually. I mean, so some some properties are easily uh, modeled by simply contrib uh, contributions from small fragments, and some are some are not. So some properties are going to be uh, predicted much more accurately than some others. So uh, indeed, kind of... uh, indeed, uh, uh, possibly it is the limitation of the method itself. Uh, but uh, yes, we will add the indications so that. Uh, prevent yeah, the user so if, from uh, inadequate uh, analysis uh, in the further steps. <clears throat> All thank right, you. thank you. Uh, looks pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Leonid. I liked uh, the uh, zoom in feature where our markers become molecules. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. This is the part of work. Uh, Thanks to Maria Dolto. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we should make it uh, everywhere whenever there are molecules on a scatter plot. Uh, uh, that, that's uh, really nice. <laughs> you mean, uh, right, Maria Dolto here? <laughs> uh, no, no, I think uh, any scatter plot whenever we have uh, molecules. With uh, molecules, yes, yes, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, basically already have that for chem space and for activity clips mm -hmm. also yeah that should just be a standard uh, yeah yeah feature. it's uh it's fantastic yeah, I agree. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, one okay. question is this feature already available somewhere uh, it should be available in the last chem version oh, it's it's already. Mm -hmm. no not yet not yet. <laughs> it is going to be released. So, so it, it, it depends on the last last chem update. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. Yeah, but it's uh, definitely should be included as part of, of the one eighteen release of the platform. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, let's uh, move to our next presenter. Uh, thank you, uh, Leonid. That was. Uh, really interesting. And we are moving to uh, Constantine. Um... Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, I can't at the moment share my screen. Uh, I guess, Andrew, yeah, you should click sure. something. Now I guess I can. Yeah. Mm. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Konstantin. I'm a developer at Datacroc. Uh, and uh, I'm here to present the new sticky meta feature we've developed. That's pretty great, so I'm excited to introduce you to it. Um, we will have a Q&A session in the end, but feel free to interrupt me. I guess there might be some parts where uh, it would be reasonable to stop and discuss what uh, is great uh, about the feature and uh, how it can be used in different ways from what I will be showing shown during the demo. Uh, so let's start with the, the idea of what Sticky Meta is uh, of our feature. Um, and uh, we took inspiration from uh, Sticky Notes, I would say, uh, and developed a data annotation tool uh, that allows us to uh, attach uh, arbitrary metadata to objects uh, that you're working with, uh, with two uh, properties that are I would say important in uh, research process. Uh, they are globally available uh, and you can share this data with your colleagues automatically. So it's a great tool for collaboration. You can find some insights uh, from different contexts. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, how I think it would be useful for everyone. Mm, let me show you what I mean by that uh, by a demo. I'll take a molecules data set and uh, we'll uh, show you how we can uh, comment uh, some data with, that we think are interesting and how it will be available for uh, anyone else in different contexts. Um, let me open 
some sort of data set I already have, this one. Uh, this is a data set that has uh, two columns. Uh, it's column with uh, molecules and uh, some experiment data activity parameter of these molecules. I have another table uh, in the project, uh, which is not really related to uh, the one I'm showing you right now. Uh, it will have uh, the same structure, but different parameter. Uh, both these tables are just pure uh, CSV uploaded files. So it's not like uh, they were created artificially. Uh, I downloaded some CSV file. I added some modifications on my own uh, and uploaded it to the platform. Um, let's do some sort of uh, pretty basic analysis of this uh, data. Uh, for example, we can filter uh, it by activity and uh, keep only high activity elements. Mm. For example, like that. Um, now, uh, sticky meta kicks in. Uh, what we can do with this feature uh, is we can annotate uh, molecules themselves, not a cell and data frame, uh, but uh, an instance of a molecule. So we have uh, a set of molecules, which are, uh, yeah, we, we have some sort of uh, properties that they all have. They are uh, high activity molecules. Uh, let's select any of them. You can see my tooltip says me that this cell can store sticky matter. Uh, that's because uh, element in this cell is a molecule. Uh, our platform uh, detected it. Now let's right click and open sticky matter menu. I can either annotate uh, only one element or edit everything uh, that is available to me right now. I will uh, put a comment column. Mm. What just happened? Uh, it created a column. This is a sticky column. This column will be synchronized uh, with molecules that we see in the same row. And it opened me a batch edit uh, tool of Datagrog that allows me to fill uh, this column with some sort of data. Um, batch edit allows me to uh, edit either selected columns or filtered or uh, some different options as well. Let's stick with filtered columns. Uh, and here I have smiles comment. What I will do is I'll put some sort of comment here. Uh, let's use uh, let's use high activity as a message uh, to enter for this, all these molecules. Now I click enter and uh, it is added to all the molecules. Uh, now let's see what happened. Uh, it re reloaded uh, molecules, some of them uh, faster than others. Uh, you can see that color of tooltip for some molecules had already changed. For some others, uh, it's in the progress, I guess. Uh, what is happening uh, in uh, tooltip now? You can see the information about this uh, about this compound that it has high activity. What is great uh, about that is the fact that now we can move to another data frame, an O count, and uh, in this data frame we have a different set of molecules. They are also annotated with uh, dot that uh, tells us that this cell can store sticky matter. But let's now go to filtering options. And now we can see that smiles column, it has sticky matter values. Uh, so we have a tag icon available. And if I click on it, it allows me to perform filtering uh, by this comment parameter I've already added. Um, so yeah, I clicked on it and it allowed me to filter only molecules where comment is high activity. So that's a way for me uh, to fetch data from uh, another context without even knowing where this table uh, was uh, before. So uh, working with uh, an account table, I don't need really a data frame uh, that had uh, activity data before. Uh, it works uh, from any context, basically. Um, Let's, yeah, for, for example, you can see that this uh, uh, benzene molecule, uh, it has high activity tooltip uh, and uh, exactly the same molecule uh, we had uh, present over here. So that's uh, overall flow of 
how it works. Um, and uh, now what I plan to do is I plan to uh, tell you more about how it works because uh, I showed you only one use case, but overall uh, you can attach uh, metadata to basically anything uh, that you store in your tables. So it's really powerful and uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess I, I should tell how to configure it, how to use it in your projects uh, and uh, take the most of it. Let me move uh, back to first, my... uh, Thanks, let's probably pause for a second. And before we go to how to use it, let's make sure that everyone understands what uh, we are doing. Uh, I think it's pretty clear, but let's just reiterate. Uh, it's a way to add uh, structured information to uh, data points that would be available globally across the whole organization. So for instance, you can put a comment to a molecule in one place and your colleague uh, on the other end of the world when he or she is looking at the same molecule, will immediately see uh, uh, that uh, comment. And that data lives in the uh, data group uh, uh, database. So that's the very high level idea. Uh, so I just want to make sure that everyone uh, knows what we are doing before we proceed to how to. Any questions up to this point? So uh, one question, Andrew, um, where does this, uh, so right now this is uh, the two CSV files that he's showing, right? Um, but uh, you mentioned they get stored in database. Uh, how, do, how do you store it? This seems like it's um, on the platform, right? I mean, on this visualization right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, so um, the way they are stored, um, is we basically attach uh, a value to uh, a molecule and we store uh, in a database information then a molecule that we identify as, uh, uh, I don't know, like for example, benzene uh, stores this sort of uh, string value. Uh, mm, you can uh, export uh, this data uh, as a column. So yeah, I can, for example, remove this column and uh, it would uh, still work. Uh, the, just to, we have supported uh, the functionality to uh, export this data as a column. For example, uh, if I go for sticky matter of this cell only, I can see it uh, has some data, but not only that, I have a plus uh, button that allows me to export it. Um, it will take some time, yeah, and it uploaded it. So uh, the data that you see here, uh, this data is uh, sourced from the database. And uh, for sticky matter, source of truth is the data from the database. And uh, we supported our uh, table views to work with that data. Mm -hmm. See. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let me also rephrase it uh, slightly uh, differently. Uh, yeah, the data is stored in uh, the data grok uh, metadata uh, database. Uh, the key is the actual uh, molecule. We canonicalize it, uh, so we can use, of course, molecules and any other types. And there is also a way to canonicalize uh, the uh, key. Uh, in yeah, case. that's exactly what I was going to talk about later. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I tried not to overcomplicate things at that moment. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I'm just. Uh, I know that people will ask that question because everyone knows how molecules can be <laughs> represented. <laughs> Uh, so the column that you see on the right, which is uh, smiles, uh, column comments, smiles, is the name of the schema, and Costa will explain it later, and comment is the name of the field. Uh, you also mm -hmm. see the uh, circle uh, in the column name, and that uh, means that this column is special. It's uh, materialized uh, in uh, Kostya's session uh, as a regular uh, data grok data frame column, but also at the same time, it's uh, data, the source of truth lives on a uh, database. So if uh, Kostya will uh, edit uh, any field, uh, the database value will change. And if he has privileges, of course, subject to restrictions, uh, and the other person will uh, see the uh, change. So uh, these are actually uh, data that uh, are attached to uh, objects. Uh, they can be molecules, they can be anything, and Costa will uh, describe later how to uh, create schemas, associate it, and so on. Uh, but uh, yeah, that lets you uh, 
uh, create and manage structured uh, metadata related to any objects, not necessarily managed by data group. For instance, this could be well, molecules we all already see, or uh, proteins, or experimental plates, uh, or Campbell ideas, anything. Uh, the, only need, the only requirement here is to obtain a key and a type uh, that we can later associate in our schema. And this is uh, what Poster will explain now, uh, how to do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, if anyone has other questions before I move to how to make it work uh, in your data group instance uh, and uh, yeah, connect the data with metadata, uh, I, I can answer some questions before that, or we can just move on. So the, uh, the annotation can only be text, right? Uh, not necessarily. So, uh, in this case, I, uh, chose a text field, but overall, uh, you can, we support, uh, several, uh, basic types right now. Uh, and, uh, we are on our way to support, uh, multiple different editors for them, uh, and, uh, um, extend it further. So right now it supports already numerical values. Uh, it supports string type, uh, with, uh, um, constraints on, uh, for example, a uh, number of choices you have, so you can, uh, mm -hmm. attach enum values. Uh, mm -hmm. it also supports, uh, Boolean values and date times as well. Yeah. Uh, and we can also specify the semantic type of the uh, attached property. So for instance, uh, if, uh, the object that we attach properties to is for instance, a protein, we can specify that the property could be a string, but the semantic type of the string is a molecule. And then, uh, it would, uh, a sketcher would appear that lets you <laughs> sketch molecules for, uh, the specified pocket. So uh, we really reuse the uh, concept of uh, data group uh, inputs uh, and semantic types and metadata, and it all comes uh, together. And properties are also aggregated in schemas. So, uh, well, of course, they have the stages here. So yeah. It, it explains schemas. And... Yeah, you, you, if I let you talk, talk for longer, you'll, you'll redo the second part of my presentation. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's uh, move on to the... Uh, just, just, just yet not oh, a yeah. quick, very quick question. Yeah, of course, so, of course. Uh, what, what will happen if you have if, if you attach more than one sticky attribute? Uh, how would it appear? Um, I'm. Uh, let, let me think if I can uh, demonstrate for you quickly without breaking the overall flow. Uh, I, I will demonstrate it uh, like yeah. two, two minutes later, I guess. Uh, but right now I can just uh, tell you that. When you open a menu for uh, editing uh, sticky meta for itself, you will have multiple fields over here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, editing of, uh, for example, uh, one field, uh, yeah, you, you will be able to edit them as a group. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that little, mar ex and that little them marker, uh, that little marker, colored marker uh, at the top right uh corner of each cell uh would it be like multiple markers or is it still one marker uh at the moment it's still one marker basically what marker indicates at the moment is whether or not uh you should uh take a look at this cell basically whether or not uh, there is some interesting information uh hidden into the mm -hmm. object yeah the dark oh, okay. marker means the, there is some metadata associated with the data point and uh, the light marker uh means that uh Nothing is associated, but it can be. Yeah. Hmm. All right, looks interesting. <laughs> Let's see if the users find it useful. As Victor Labanov said, remember, we should give our users something useful to use. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, let's move further. Uh, I will now, if I can click, of course. Um, I will, uh, tell you about how it works, uh, under the hood. Um, so let me introduce you to the concept of entities that Datagrog has. Basically, uh, in Datagrog, uh, most of, uh, things you see on the platform is an entity. Uh, it's, it's sort of internal one. Function is an entity, table is an entity, project is an entity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, of course they have their, uh, own, uh, identifier and they're stored in the database. 
what we do for sticky meta is we extend our uh, concept of entity to external entities that come from data. They are accessible from tables and we identify them using uh, a key of this uh, uh, of the object in the data. And uh, as well as internal entities, external entities can uh, support uh, and uh, have some metadata attached to them. We store them uh, in database based on the key that uh, we get from them. Uh, in most regular case, uh, their key would be just their plain uh, values uh, converted to string. Uh, but uh, we support, uh, and I will tell you uh, about it later, more advanced ways to do that as well. Uh, let's move from uh, the overall concept of entity to how we specify what is an entity and what is not, because that's another interesting question. Uh, and um, I'll just show you right ahead how it looks like in uh, the platform. Um, what I will do is I will go to sticky meta section in our platform. This is the way where we, where, uh, we can specify the data that we are working on and uh, what, what exactly the platform should be looking for. Because uh, as you've seen, uh, it doesn't highlight numeric cells, for example, it only highlights molecules. Um, I, we have several types over here. Um, let me show you, for example, molecule type is the type that we worked on, uh, worked with uh, just before. Um, let me show you what it has inside of it. Uh, it's, its name is type. And the only thing that we really need for uh, sticky meta to detect objects is a sort of expression that works on columns. Uh, so for example, for detecting molecules, it's uh, as easy as just specifying that uh, semantic type of uh, the column is molecule. After that, uh, platform automatically uh, fetches uh, all the columns uh, and with, while working with columns understands if column is special or not. Uh, and if, if, if it stores some objects. We can work uh, with uh, any arbitrary uh, column text as well, for example, I have uh, a demo file uh, of uh, st study example, I would say, that was created automatically using our uh, JS API. Uh, here you can see that matching expression is different. Uh, it matches uh, columns that are marked as study. And I will show you right now how it looks uh, into the demo table because it looks, I would say, differently from molecules uh, in a way. And uh, it would be interesting for you as well. Um, we can also, we support multiple tag values. Uh, so for example, we can write source equals study, comma, uh, ID uh, equals, uh, I don't know, uh, and some sort of UUID uh, if you wish. Let's move to another uh, demo file uh, that was generated using the API. So here yeah. uh, we have a, a column study. And uh, as you can see, I will open the properties of this column. And you will see here that this column has tag source equals study. Because of this tag, DataGrok knows that we should look into it and that we should uh, try to find objects from here in our database. Uh, before the demo, I've already put some values into it. Well, not, not me exactly. I just uh, run the uh, script from our samples that did that for me. Uh, and you can see that I attached some data uh, to any cells uh, from here. Um, and uh, let me open one of them. Uh, so to answer the question about data formats, you will see that, uh, for example, here, uh, I can attach uh, a date time, basically, and I have our default editor for, for data time. Mm. Not only that, but also uh, sticky meta works, uh, I would say, uh, uh, another way as well. Uh, not only you can uh, edit uh, sticky meta from, uh, for, for example, this menu or from batch edit, you can also edit sticky meta directly from your column and it will be fetched. Uh, let me select some data that is easy to show you. Uh, I would say this one. Uh, it is the uh, seventh of the March, uh, and I change it to tenth of the March, for example. After that, when I go to tooltip, it fetches new data. 
Not only that, but uh, if I sort my data here based on study number, because it's pretty big data frame, it has 10,000 rows. Uh, every element in here will have uh, the same new data uh, and uh, the same tooltip. So the data is updated every time we work with it. Uh, mm. And at the same time, uh, as, as you can imagine, I wasn't like specifying directly how to work with uh, such strange formats, study 99, uh, study, uh, study 98, and so on. Uh, it is just saved uh, in uh, our database by key equal to the string representation of this cell. But for example, for molecules, we've uh, done a different approach. For molecules, we understand that there are a lot of formats in which you can write it. So for molecules, uh, we have a special function, uh, I would say a kind of uh, a special family of functions uh, that are annotated with canonicalizer tag. Uh, and our uh, CAM plugin, uh, it has already a defined uh, function for canonicalizer uh, purposes, this one. And uh, yeah, it takes molecules and input and produces molecules and output. And this function can be used uh, to move uh, data from one format to another and uh, to transform your molecule from, uh, for example, a uh, mole block uh, to canonical smiles. And then use canonical smiles uh, key to save data into the database. So that's great because you don't need to specifically worry about formats you are working in. Uh, it's, in a sense, it's better than just pure uh, join by uh, some string value. Now, I think uh, it's a great time to answer some questions regarding how we define uh, and detect entities. Uh, and if there won't be any, I will go to how we uh, define what we attach to the objects themselves, what's the data. Uh, yeah, because we should be uh, a bit considerate of the time. We still have two oh, presentations. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we. Uh, yeah, okay, I, 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 I can go for it. Uh, details uh, on uh, all the plumbing, uh, especially uh, considering that it's all uh, documented now in Wiki. But I, I think what we should show is the concept of uh, schemas and how we. Yeah, uh, yeah that's exactly what structure. I want. Yeah, and uh, also what's important is the other way how do we browse the data going not from the data points, but from schemas. Uh, yeah, of course. So uh, the second uh, submenu of sticky meta is schemas. And we use schemas to define what data do we attach to objects. So uh, schema are a two-way connector. So uh, we define what do we attach uh, this uh, data to. So we can attach this both to molecules and for study identifiers as well. Uh, and yeah, but like that. Uh, and uh, not only that, but we can also specify how many properties do we want to attach uh, to this comment. For example, I can uh, take an author, uh, yeah, author name and add it to the schema. And after that, as I save the schema, and I, for example, uh, go back to my table and uh, right click uh, and open the editor, I will get uh, more data available for me. So now I can also, uh, present some more metadata. I can add that this was a great study. And I can add uh, an Aether, uh, I would just write my name, and uh, save this data as well. Schema work as a uh, block of data. So these values are grouped in a way. And now um, this data will be available uh, from tooltip as well. And I guess to... Mm, have enough time for everyone else to present their features, I will move straight to Q&A section. All right, yeah, I, I guess it would be much more beneficial for everyone if I just stay here and answer some questions. So my favorite question, <laughs> what are we going to do next with uh, all of this machinery? Uh, 
we still have some uh, refinings to do, I would say. Uh, so this feature is currently a beta feature. Uh, it should be enabled specifically, and uh, it's uh, yeah from the settings uh, beta. Uh, we have uh, yet to uh, add some more uh, editor capabilities and uh, allow a much more broader uh, way of using it uh, in terms of what can be attached. Uh, and how it should be edited and how it should be displayed to those who will uh, look at it later. So I guess that's the main way uh, of advancing this feature. And yeah, I just forgot to show you that we also have uh, the same data frames, but with all the objects from the platform uh, in types menu. So you can access them from here as well. It might be useful for you uh, if you, for example, uh, try to get information from all the data from the platform, not from one specific data set. Yeah. Well, uh, now... quite, quite, quite frankly, it's kind of a pretty, pretty uh, interesting thing, but I'm not really sure that's extremely useful, though. Uh, I don't, I don't see clear use cases where it would be like you, you couldn't do something. Uh, before and then all sighting with those sticky metadata, uh, you would be able to do that. So that's uh, so one a popular scenario is when you have an external database uh, like Campbell and you want to add another field <laughs> to a molecule, but you cannot because it's external. Uh, but now you can do it with the data group. So uh, all of the information would still reside in Campbell, but now you can uh, store additional information mapped to it, and it all will be interactively uh, working automatically in data group. And that's just one way. Uh, another uh, use case is, for instance, uh, you are running some sort of uh, hit uh, triage campaign, and you want to collect uh, people opinions on well, molecules. So you don't have to build any application. Uh, what you simply need is to define a mapping uh, and uh, set privileges who can edit what, and you are done. So uh, while... it sort of implies implies the presence of some kind of uh, an ambiguous, unique identifier of that yeah. object, right? Yes. Yeah. Th yeah. That's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. And once you do that, you can add structures information, assign privileges, uh, and you automatically can uh, browse, uh, uh, navigate, uh, analyze, filter it. Uh, so, so, so in terms of in terms of that unique identifier, uh, what what can serve as a unique identifier? Some kind of primary key in a table on the database, or uh, or an individual molecular structure, or or how do you actually make sure that the, the uh, meta information is applied to the correct entity. We take entity key, uh, as an identifier, we use a pair of uh, entity key and entity type. So key is basically uh, either uh, a direct string representation uh, of uh, data or uh, a canonicalized string representation of data. So for example, I showed that uh, we have packages that, uh, for example, uh, as CAM defines for molecule, there can be other functions defining how to transform a key into a unique identifier. So yeah, uh, existence of a uh, unique entity identifier uh, is implied, but it could be taken from a uh, real live data, I would say. So uh, canonical smiles, for example, uh, is enough for us uh, to be at an identifier. Mm -hmm. But what, what happens if uh, your data is denormalized? And uh, suppose you have uh, a table which contains uh, several instances of an identical structure, and you apply uh, uh, your sticky note to one of them, is it going to automatically be applied to uh, all others? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we're talking about applying data to molecules specifically, and our table has several molecules, then yes, this data will be applied to several uh, objects, several molecules, and we'll comment all of them. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, seems to be a nice feature, but without actually having used that uh, myself, I can't really... Uh, like... 
tell how yeah, you... dangerous it is. You know, Zeka mm -hmm. seems to be a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I also in, should. In, sense, in essence, you can make mistakes inadvertently. I guess we also should notice uh, once uh, again uh, the fact that uh, this data can be shared and uh, it is a nice way of uh, going through your data and exploring uh, and basically collaborating with other people's uh, metadata that they assign because if you assign meaningful information to objects and other people can gather this meaningful information, then uh, overall your research process becomes uh, uh, improved. Mm. Yep. So, Dima, one more example. Remember, we did that uh, wisdom of crowds for annotating chemical compounds uh, plugin in 3DX back in JNJ days 20 years ago. So, now you can do it with just a simple configuration in DataGrok. You specify uh, whether uh, it's an upvote on a molecule or a downvote uh, via a controlled vocabulary on a property. Uh, and you uh, tell that chemists can uh, vote on it uh, and others can view it, and this is it. <laughs> well, well, well uh, by the way, uh, by the way, that, uh, that thing has still been used, uh, believe it or not. Uh, I mean, the voting uh, system. Mm -hmm. um, and some, some people have uh, recently requested the results from the voting campaigns uh, mm -hmm. we ran about 10 years ago. So I, mm -hmm. I extracted the data, uh, so it's still useful. But, but uh, most use of case. the functionality- it Available automatically. Yeah. And whenever anyone look, is looking at a molecule that has uh, some sort of rating, you would see it in a property panel if you want to. Yeah, well, it's well, it's one, one side rating. of it, but, uh, but the most useful part of that voting infrastructure is the uh, the interface that sort of uh, implements a certain workflow where you have uh, uh, subsets of uh, molecules presented to users on which they vote. So without without and then it actually re it actually kind of uh, keeps extracting uh, subsets from the set of uh, on on which the user held. Uh, specific user has not voted yet. You, you remember how it works, obviously. Uh, but uh, without adding adding any extra functionality to data growth, you can't really replicate that with just in the sticky notes. Yeah, it probably does 80% of work, but uh, it can be scripted. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I think we should move to our next uh, session. Uh, unless there are any other questions at this point? Okay, thanks, Costa. Clearly, very uh, interesting feature that has a lot of uh, potential. Um, we'll keep posting also about it on our. Yes, community. thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. everyone. Thanks, okay. and we are moving to our next presenter, Alexandra. Alexandra, My turn. hold on a second. I'll make you a host in just a second. Okay, uh, okay. Oh, here you are. Yep. Okay, I should try. Yeah. Okay, you should see my screen right now, yeah? Yep, everything's fine. Uh, great. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a developer at DataCroc. Today, I'm excited to introduce you one of our latest features, the docking plugin. So, okay, let's imagine a situation that we are working on developing new drugs to treat diseases. So one of the key challenges in drug discovery uh, is understanding how potential drug molecules interact with target proteins in the body. So it can be kind of complicated and time consuming. At, and here at DataCroc, we really understand the importance of simplifying this process. That is why we developed the docking plugin that I will show you today. 
Currently, we use Autodoc GPU. This is an open source, a state of the art docking tool. So, in addition, we can switch to any other tool if needed. Uh, before I dive into the details, let me walk you through some data preparation process. We understand that setting up docking configuration can be kind of challenging. Therefore, we have simplified this process. The intended scenario is that we have one person or just a person that is familiar with the tool. And what this person needs to do, just two things, to prepare, uh, to identify a pocket and to prepare a configuration file. How to prepare the configuration file? Uh, you just simply need to run a desktop application for this. You can use Autodoc desktop application, for instance. So when you have these two files, you just simply need to put them into the folder. So on my screen right now, you see that we have under the docking folder, we have targets folder. In this targets folder, I place my own folder with macromolecule and the config we have prepared earlier. So right now we are set up and we can move on on running our docking simulation. In order to run the docking simulation, you need simply to navigate to chem of the dock and a dialog appears. So what do we have in this dialog? We need to configure only four parameters. Everything is simple once we've done the whole preparation. So the table, this is our current table, small molecules to dock. This is smiles, target. This is our folder with config and macromolecule, the step I have told you before. So here you can choose your own targets folder that you have prepared and number of confirmations to search. Uh, I did it in advance. So here you can see on my screen just results. Uh, as a result, we have two columns. The first column is a column with 3D poses, and the second column is our binding energy value. As you may see, uh, the whole data frame is sorted and color coded. We did it based on binding energy value. So uh, the lower value, the better binding, uh, the better stability. And one more thing. So when you click on the pose, on the pane right now, you can see our docking pane. On this docking pane, there is a mall star viewer zoomed to the binding pocket. Actually, this is the task we wanted to solve. I will just show you how perfectly it fits when I will move from one cell to another. I just adore how it looks. And under the viewer, you can see some additional properties that were calculated. So after Dog GPU gives us a whole log, and from this log, we just uh, exported some properties that you may be interested in. So, for instance, intermolecule energy or uh, ligand fixed. So whatever you want, this may be interesting for you. You can add it to the whole data frame by simply clicking on the plus icon like that, and all the results appear. However, there can be a situation when something can go wrong. It happens sometimes. So for instance, here you can see an empty cell. We don't have a 3D pose there. So it tells us that, oh my God, something went wrong. So for user, to understand, we just in the same tab, docking tab, we put the log from after doc GPU. And in this log, you can understand actually what was wrong. So here there is an error specified that no map file specified. And right now you understand, oh, that was a problem somewhere in my config file I have prepared. And you know what to do in order to get the results. I really like it. That's uh, a cool tool. So, and I think like a conclusion that the docking plugin integration is just like a natural addition to all our tools and to our rich informatics system. 
And in addition, we have specific apps that benefit from this integration, such as Hit Triage and Hit Design that David will show later after me today. Therefore, I think that docking plugin is just a perfect fit for this application and just for the users and makes your life easier, happier, and not so complicated <laughs> for you as a chemist. Yes, thank you for your attention. That is all. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I really like how interactive uh, it is. Uh, and I think you can also pop out the big uh, docking configuration, right? In in full view, because currently it's a little bit smaller. Uh, uh, so yes, when you click uh, on the pose, uh, it appears on the right. Can we make it bigger and uh, yes. explore it in more details? Uh, you want small star viewer to be bigger. Uh, yes. Yes, like that. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. So actually, you can uh, go uh, in more uh, details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here. <laughs> oh, what do you want me to go? <laughs> oh, it, it's <laughs> good. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> There is all the information. I just don't want. Mm -hmm. oh, I don't understand what you want. No, no, no I, I was just going to show that we can expand it uh, because it was just small uh, by default. Uh, any uh, question? Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, you have presented it to some CAD folks, uh, computer aided drug design folks uh, at J and J or any other uh, interested uh, groups of people. Uh, not yet. We did not demo it to JNJ yet. I think we demoed it to uh, one or two other companies. Uh, but yeah, we can do it. Uh, so yeah, yeah it'll be. Uh, I think it'll be useful uh, to present it to a more focused group. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be used oh, in multiple oh. uh, scenarios. Uh, in particular, yeah, virtual screening and also heat design. Well, David will uh, mention a bit of that in, in the next presentation. But yeah, I agree completely. And it could be also customized towards a particular uh, scenario. What we showed today is just very uh, bare bones and basic, uh, but uh, multiple uh, backends could be added and uh, multiple uh, ways to display and analyze document results could also be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think I should be presented to a focused group of uh, CAD folks who actually do those things on a regular basis. Because uh, I don't think uh, there anyone, there's anyone present in this meeting, right? Uh, who is a, mm -hmm. uh, who's a, who's mm -hmm. kind of well-versed in using docking software. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have any in, in the current audience. Could be. I, I don't know. I know uh, Ritankar expressed some interest in docking and uh, Tom too. <laughs> <laughs> so you might be wrong, Dima. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, All I right. Don't, I don't uh, hear anyone asking any questions. <laughs> That's... Yes. Yeah. Oh, was that a question? I mean, what, what other methods do you plan to support, like uh, Vina or Schrodinger's Glide? We've been thinking about Vina, actually. We can do this if there is a business case for this and if someone is going to use it. Andrew, we discussed it with uh, Andrew Santrosan about Neomorphs use case because they uh, don't need just uh, the sleek and receptor case. Yeah. Yeah, we can. If, also... if you need it, we can make it. There is no problem in it. We can adjust it. it it's quite simple. Yeah, the beauty is that uh, they all follow uh, more or less the same idea where there is a configuration file that you can then run. So the complexity is actually integrating all of that and presenting the user interface. Uh, so this is uh, done uh, already. Uh, switching to a new backend is pretty much uh, straightforward. So we will definitely integrate with uh, 
uh, probably uh, Artidoc, which is uh, another state of the art uh, docking solution, which is now part of Bio uh, Nemo, which is um, NVIDIA's uh, life science platform. So, uh, plenty of uh, opportunities <laughs> to grow in different directions. But uh, Dima uh, is right. We yeah, need to. Uh, explore and address uh, use cases and talk to the actual people who do science. Yeah, I think the the preparation step is, you say, like, take some configuration and who would be an appropriate person to do that? Mm -hmm. well, like I a comp really, chemist or? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, sometimes uh, yeah, even uh, human chromaticians have enough uh, skills, but uh, the thing is there would be yeah one person who prepared the docking pocket, the, the experiment, and then, uh, for instance, chemists can start designing molecules, and as they design molecules, uh, the, they will be docked in real time, so you can <laughs> uh, already see uh, how it would work. Okay, I think it's time to move to our next and final presenter, uh, David. Uh, David, you will be a host in a second. Uh, done. Thanks. Uh, oh, oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. I'm still not a host, I guess. Uh, no, you are. Uh, hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you try again? It still says host disabled participant screen. Uh, Andrew, I believe you uh, clicked on Denise instead of David. Um, okay, let me reclaim David. Now you are the host. Um, host. And now I. All right. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David. I am a developer here at Datagrog, and uh, I'm going to be presenting two new very cool applications that we've added to our platform, Heat Design and Heat Triage. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, so you all might be very familiar with uh, Schrodinger's live design application, and uh, these two are quite similar uh, to that. Uh, but uh, what they also bring is all the uh, functions and all the cool things uh, of uh, the data grok, uh, that being uh, all of the viewers, all of the filters, all of the uh, availability of uh, different calculations, and so on. Uh, so let's start with uh, what you see here on screen, and this can be a typical campaign in hit design. And uh, here, what I have done is created a campaign and designed a few of the molecules. And I have defined some of the uh, molecular descriptors that I wanted to calculate for them. And here, what I can do is, for example, add a new row of molecules from the plus button here. And for example, add a uh, benzyl ring. And all of the same properties that uh, have been defined for all will be uh, calculated as well. Uh, then also just to mention what Konstantin was uh, showing, that it also integrates the sticky meta functionality. So the comment that uh, Konstantin has added also shows up in a tooltip here. Uh, that's uh, uh, one of the uh, cool th uh, features of uh, connectivity inside of uh, Datagrog. Uh, what I also can do, for example, is if I have a, a molecule that I particularly like or uh, is showing potential, I can right click on it and uh, I can say duplicate molecule, which will show me a uh, dialogue with that molecule where I can uh, modify it, for example, add a methyl group here. And that will add a new row with all the same calculations. And as you can see, I have added some of the viewers, some of the filters, which as uh, usual data grok fashion goes, all are interacting with each other. And I also have available all the chemistry uh, context panel stuff uh, that you see on the right here. So everything uh, works in a general data grok fashion. 
what I also can do here is go into the progress tracker uh, view, which allows me to move the molecules into different stages. And here uh, we are presented with a tiles view uh, where I can, for example, grab a molecule and move it from one stage uh, to another, for example, from design to synthesis. And if I go back, uh, this uh, corresponding molecule uh, will have uh, changed uh, its status in the stage column. These stages can be defined before the campaign starts, and then they will uh, stick there as well. Uh, then if I want to add some of the new calculations, I can go into this wrench icon here. Uh, and for example, as uh, before, I only had some of the descriptors calculated. Now I can add, for example, toxicity risks and choose some of the toxicity risks. And just to mention here, uh, these compute functions can be uh, basically anything that is available for molecules in data grok. Uh, so everything can be integrated uh, and is integrated here, like uh, admitox and uh, docking that Alexandra mentioned. But it can be very, very easily extended as well. Uh, so uh, users and different platforms can add uh, very simply different functions that could be Python, JavaScript, or even queries, and they will uh, automatically show up here as well. And when I click OK, uh, the newly uh, added properties will be calculated and the corresponding columns will be added. And next time I add a new molecule, these corresponding values of uh, mutagenicity and so on will be uh, calculated uh, as well. Hey, uh, just want to pause for a bit if anyone has questions so far. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, uh, yep. So uh, how, how how would a user uh, who is presented with this data find out uh, which method was used to compute those uh, uh, computed properties like uh, mutagenicity and such? Is there, a, is there a way to find out, like, say, if it says irritating effects, uh, I would like to know which method uh, was used to compute this. Uh, in set, well, first of all, the uh, columns that are added, but you can also see it in the compute dialog here with its uh, the functions that are used are marked with check marks, and uh, you can see here that uh, well, from the descriptor, some molecular weights have been calculated and. Uh, some others as well. And if I go here, I can see that these have been calculated as well. And also- No, no uh, uh, what, what, I, what I mean is that uh, there are some properties that are, uh, that are kind of uh, uh, trivial, like molecular weight. You don't really need to know uh, which toolkit was used to compute it or, or how it was computed because it's a molecular weight, right? But yeah. when we're talking about those uh, properties such as like uh, irritating effects or uh, reproductive effects, I, as a as a chemist, I would like to know which method you use to compute those. Mm -hmm. uh, so if uh, if you just show that option list, right, uh, without showing any references to the actual algorithm, uh, I would say, oh, I wonder which mm -hmm. which toolkit was used because there are kind of multiple ways of doing that. It's yeah. uh, because it's a model. Uh, yes, Dima, that's a great uh, question. That's probably something that we overlooked uh, in the user interface, but uh, we'll uh, correct it <laughs> very soon. So what uh, needs to be done, uh, David, can you please open that uh, dialog where we select uh, methods? Yeah, it should, right. it should have some, some kind of reference to the yeah. actual method uh, or description or uh, rep mm -hmm. link to publication or whatever for each right. of those properties. Yes, I, I'll explain how it would work. So uh, on the left side, uh, so this list is actually a list of uh, functions uh, that uh, are collected dynamically based on the uh, metadata. Uh, and uh, in the description of the function, we actually have references to the scientific method. In this case, it's the uh, OCL library that computes toxicity. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what we should do is we should simply uh, point to this function <laughs> in this uh, user interface uh, and also connect uh, the columns that we produce uh, back to the function too so that from the data view you can uh, infer what was used uh, so yeah that's a great point Dima will uh, uh, introduce it I completely agree 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, because it will uh, raise questions if you say, oh, it has high irritating effects, and then is it, was it experimentally measured? No, I have computed it, and then the next question comes, uh, which method did you use? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's a great question indeed, and uh, I guess what Andrew says will greatly aid in, in, in that sense. Thank you. All right, uh, then I will go on. Uh, so uh, the coolest, uh, one of the coolest things about this application is very, uh, that, that it's very easily shareable on the platform. So once I've done all the calculations, I have uh, added some viewers for visualizing, I have filtered the data, so on, so on. Uh, what I can just do is either copy a link to a colleague. So if I copy a link to a colleague anywhere uh, else on the platform and he just opens or he or she just opens the link, they will be presented with exact same view, with exact same configuration and exactly the same uh, exactly the same viewers. So uh, basically shareability goes uh, in a very root of this application. Uh, now uh, let's... Uh, a look at how the application itself uh, works. So uh, it can be found in the uh, Datagrog apps. So we just click on hit design and we are presented with first a, a table of ongoing campaigns with a little bit of information about them. So where they, when they were started, how many molecules there have been designed and what's their status. Uh, and uh, well, we can start a new uh, campaign. So uh, all of this is built on the principle of templates and campaigns and template will define what sort of uh, function uh, goes, what sort of functions are calculated for the molecules, what sort of stages there are and what other additional fields uh, there are for the campaign. Uh, so here I can define that for each campaign, I need to know who's the main chemist, for example, when's the deadline, uh, for example, what's the target scaffold, and I can add them uh, like this. So I just go in and say target scaffold, and I can choose a type of molecule here, and it will then present me on the starting of campaign with the input of type molecule, where I can uh, sketch it, uh, or some other types like string, number, boolean, uh, date, or uh, we can add some more here uh, as well. And uh, then we also define uh, stages. So in the previous one I showed you just here, it had four stages. So if I go back here, it had a design, consideration, synthesis, and testing. But uh, in different campaigns, uh, those can be different, uh, even less or more. So I can define them from here and add as many as I want. I define some of the computations I want to do. Uh, and uh, basically then create a new template. And then on top of this template, I can build as many campaigns as I want. And users can be able to share it between each other and share the progress with just the link or uh, basically clicking on the link from, uh, from this table. That uh, will do the same thing as well. So for example, from here, if I open uh, this one that is uh, that was open on my previous tab, you can see that exactly the same view with all the viewers and all the calculated properties have been uh, opened up here as well. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Great. Uh, uh, it would probably make sense to slightly cover the list of available uh, computations and the way we uh, collect them. So uh, I don't know if you were planning to do it, but I think it's worth... Yeah, uh, I, I, I was. I was just uh, pausing. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, every... Uh, every computation that is available in our CAM package or for uh, molecules on Datagrog can be uh, uh, used in heat triage and heat design as well. Uh, right now, they can be uh, selected from this dialog, and this dialog is dynamically populated from all the uh, Datagrog. So basically, in detail, all it needs is a special tag uh, of the function, uh, heat triage uh, 
uh, heat triage function. This uh, this tag is called so, uh, and uh, then basically uh, these applications will uh, search all of the data grok for all available functions inside packages, scripts, uh, queries, and so on. And everything can be used as a computation as well. And uh, just to show, I have a few examples. So here is one in, uh, it can be just plain JavaScript in, in our scripting. Uh, uh, tab we can just add a script and uh, we can just add a tag of heat triage function and this one will be automatically picked up there uh, we can write it in python with the same tag and uh, again this will be picked up uh, by the application or it can be a query even uh, so we can use queries as computations with the same tag and in this case what it does is it goes to Campbell database it looks for the uh, it looks for the molecule if it's there and if if it finds the correct one then it pulls out the uh the mole registration number of uh Campbell and adds it to uh to the database so as uh as it already is quite rich in the number of functions that can be applied to molecules, uh, any user can extend with the uh, custom ones uh, as they desire, basically. Yeah, and, and also- uh, overall, um, Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, that's the overall uh, uh, goal and philosophy of data grok and hit uh, design in particular. Uh, out of the box, we provide a rich ecosystem of uh, visualizations, uh, functions. Uh, well, uh, we have admin calculations and you can uh, do the uh, docking from this interface and introduce uh, the sticky meta, <laughs> uh, everything that was covered today. But in addition to it's extremely easy to integrate it with the proprietary uh, systems, be it predictive engines, proprietary databases, uh, or uh, anything. And actually, we uh, already have some uh, representatives from companies on this call who uh, use it in such a manner. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, one of the biggest differences between what Data Group offers and the uh, other systems that we make it uh, so easily extensible and uh, it's uh, easy to integrate it. All right, that that looks pretty pretty great, you know. But I'm just curious, what does the submit button do? Yeah, I was just getting into it actually. <laughs> uh, so from the submit button, you can see uh, the overall information uh, about uh, the campaign, and you can save it if you change something manually. So for example, if you change some color coding or if you add a viewer and you want to just make sure that uh, the campaign is saved, you can save it or you can submit it. And I'll explain what this submit does. So when you create a template, you can define a custom, uh, let's say a uh, custom thing that you want to happen upon submitting. So for example, it can be uh, some, of this, uh, some of the workflows go like, uh, after creating some molecules and filtering them out and testing and so on, they wanted to submit for further workflows in some other uh, web service or their proprietary web service for uh, calculations that take uh, a much, uh, much longer time. And this submit button can be very, very easily mapped to whatever function that you want. So all it does basically is take the resulting data frame that has been generated of molecules after filtering and after all, uh, and uh, it sends it to the uh, functions that you predefined. So uh, this one is just a uh, simple automation of the final step after the uh, designing analysis and so on. Mm -hmm. That's right. What, what, does the, what, does the, what does the save button do? Is that the same uh, action as it would be uh as it would do uh, by simply pressing the save button next to the demo one or something different? Uh, that's a bit different. That saves the uh, saves the campaign for, uh, for the application. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, here, if I go to uh, this N N NHOH count uh, column and I uh, say that I want it to be colored uh, linearly uh, and then I hit uh, save very fast. Uh, this campaign will be saved. 
And uh, here, if I just refresh this page on just another tab, uh, the uh, campaign with uh, everything will be reloaded. Mm -hmm. Basically, and, uh, and the how? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Please. No, I was just saying that uh, everything that I have applied uh, and every setting in the campaign uh, that that will be safe. Well, what uh, you know, I I do not really use uh, data grok very often, but what uh, sometimes kind of uh, throws me off is that uh, in the user interface uh, there are so many actions that are. Uh, uh, can be done, uh, which sort of are surprising, really, because because uh, uh, because here you have uh, the buttons that have uh, that take an immediate action, like save, for instance, in the left in the left pane. If you if you press on that save button, it has some effect, right? Uh, the the process tracker uh, doesn't actually do any action; it switches the view. And the submit button results in a dialog, which has uh, three other options, uh, which uh, whose meaning is not uh, very well defined because it's not like you. If if I'm a relatively new user and I haven't used that extensively, I would, if I click on submit, I would be like scratching my head and trying to figure out uh, uh, what all those uh, actions would do because there's no clear description of any and even when i when i click a button i do not know if i'm if i'm to click this button i do not even know whether it would take an immediate action and some information will go somewhere without showing me any further options or dialogues or uh, it will pop up some dialogue and then i'll get the three of choices you know and this uh, is really irritating frankly uh i agree uh, with you, Dima, we should streamline the UX a bit. Uh, in this particular case, though, uh, hit uh, design is a highly configurable application, so uh, all of these things uh, or most of them are optional and can be turned on or off based on the template because we want uh, the core of the application to be applicable both to smaller startups uh, that uh, operate with minimum bureaucracy as well as to big pharma companies. Uh, so for instance, uh, the submit is typically when uh, the collection of molecules goes between different uh, teams. So from the team who mm -hmm. designed it, for instance, to medicinal chemists. So this is a sort of formalized process and it's uh, specified in the template. And in this case, it's important for them. This is why there is a big button. So maybe we went a bit uh, uh, overboard in this particular uh, configuration, but overall, I agree with you. We <laughs> should mm -hmm. take, uh, should clean it up. <laughs> Yeah, there are some 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 conven some conventions like, for instance, uh, normally if uh, uh, pressing some kind of button or interacting with control results in the dialogue, you usually use the uh, use of kind of three dots after uh, the name that would at least show that it will not take an immediate action. I agree completely. It's all uh, consistent in the main menus. Uh, we have uh, the three dots everywhere when a dialogue pop-ups and uh, when it's an immediate action, we don't. Uh, in this particular application, yeah, we'll, we'll make it uh, better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but otherwise it looks kind of cool. Also, the the, the tooltip, you know, which has currently been shown, none, 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 none. Uh, uh, yeah. If you so so if you if you point point uh, where you were pointing before, right? Uh, you see uh, essentially none, yes. none, 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 and uh, it's kind of hard to tell which which one is which. You know, what, uh, yeah. I'm reading the column names disappeared. We'll obviously address it. Thanks for noticing. Yeah. Uh, so we are running a bit uh, over time. Uh, we were initially planning to showcase another application uh, that is a sister or a brother of <laughs> Hit uh, Design, which is Hit Triage, which goes the opposite way, which reduces the number of uh, molecules. But uh, we will cover it in our next 
sessions. Uh, David, uh, anything you wanted to, uh, any final? Uh, yeah, maybe in just two uh, words about heat triage. It is very similar to heat design, uh, but instead of designing your own molecules, uh, basically you preload some of the data set that you have. And uh, this preloading can be done from a query, from a file, from a whatever. Uh, and uh, then the idea is to reduce the uh, reduce the number by means of filtering, calculating some of the properties and uh, stuff like that. But uh, all of the other things that I mentioned about sharing functions and so on are uh, equally uh, available in hit triage as well. Yes, that's it in two words. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll uh, demo it next time uh, in uh, three months from now. Uh, I hope to see uh, everyone th uh, there. I think uh, yeah, we should uh, wrap up. Uh, we took hour and a half and a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, thanks uh, everyone for your attention, for coming here. Uh, yeah, we are really excited about the way things uh, progress, all the functionality, and uh, thanks for supporting the platform and using it. Uh, we'll uh, post the link to the YouTube once we process the video, and I'll see you in three months. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.